Thank you for taking the time. First of all, today you're calling on the rail industry to take immediate steps to improve accountability and safety with the rail industry. Looking through the notes here, it seems like a lot of this just makes common sense. That's right. There are a lot of common sense safety steps that the rail industry has fought tooth and nail, both when it comes to regulation from my department uh, and when it comes to their own conduct. So uh, today is a three part drive. Things we're doing, things we're insisting that the railroad companies do, and things that we're calling on Congress to do in order to help us hold rail companies accountable, like uh, allowing us to have stiffer fines when we catch them in a major violation. Uh, look, for years and years, the railroad industry has spent millions lobbying, building up power in Washington to push back on common sense safety regulations like the one that we're working on at the department to require that you have at least two people uh, on the staff on a train. Believe it or not, they've been pushing to get that down to one, even though trains are getting uh, often uh, much more than a mile long. These are things that are needed. And uh, now that uh, I think there's renewed bipartisan interest in Congress in the wake of what's happened to the people of East Palestine after that derailment, now is the time to change the direction of the rail industry when it comes to their willingness to support instead of fight a higher bar on accountability and safety. Do you feel like through this process there has been a fight? I mean, are, are you getting the reaction that is deserving and needed? Well, we're going to find out how they respond to this specific set of things that I'm insisting that they do. But yeah, certainly since ever since I got this job, uh, they have been resisting uh, pushes to do things like that two-person uh, staffing uh, rule, uh, like the, the tougher standards we want to have on tank cars and their condition, uh, on uh, uh, other things having to do with uh, how these trains are operated. Uh, so uh, this is a moment to demonstrate that they're serious. Uh, I hope they take it. Uh, we're not counting on them to, to do the right thing on their own. We're going to be uh, using focused inspections uh, and a higher level of regulation on our side. But we also really need Congress to work with us. You know, right now, even if we catch a railroad in a violation that leads to a fatality, uh, the most that we can find them for in this department is about a quarter of a million dollars per violation. And while a quarter million dollars might be a lot of money for a regular American, it is dust to a multi-billion dollar company uh, like Norfolk Southern or the other major freight railroad companies. So we'd like Congress to work with us to add power and teeth to the railroad regulations we've already been developing so that we can have the right level of accountability and prevent derailments and crashes in the future. Can you explain a little bit more on how you go about doing that with Congress and, and what you are asking them? Yeah, to be clear, there are some things that we're pursuing right now that we're uh, not going to have to wait on Congress to do. But uh, a lot of this is part of a statute enacted by Congress. I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of administrations ago, there was a push to make sure that we have stronger tank cars, a higher mm -hmm. standard uh, when you're carrying certain kinds of hazardous materials. The date to get those across the system was 2025. Congress then went in and through the law, watered that down and pushed the date out to 2029. I think we ought to move that date back up. Uh, we, we're still waiting on the NTSB, which is independent uh, for some of their uh, root cause analysis about what happened in Ohio. But it is not too soon uh, to know that this would be a good move for safety and something that we should get done. I'd also like for Congress to give us a freer hand on rules around hazardous material handling uh, mm -hmm. along breaks. Uh, look, we're going to do everything we can with the authorities that we have. But I think, uh, you know, a lot of these members of Congress, especially ones who in the past have been ready to carry water for the railroad industry and now are, are saying that they're uh, uh, all over this issue. I think now's the time to demonstrate that by coming to the table on a bipartisan basis to raise the bar on accountability. Clearly a national story here locally. We have done so many stories talking with residents and, you know, there's just people searching for answers right now and, and a lot of them not getting them. Who is accountable to the residents of East Palestine? Who do residents go to? Well, when it comes to their safety, uh, that's where uh, the EPA and I know the administrators on the ground again today uh, and state authorities can give them the best answers on the results of testing, air, air testing, soil testing, water testing. Meanwhile, you've got the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB. They are independent from my agency. They're independent for good reason. Uh, they're generally the ones who, who are first uh, to create a, an analysis of the causes. And then on the health side, because I know there are a lot of health concerns, and uh, uh, that's very understandable. If, if, if you live near this incident, uh, you've seen the headlines, maybe you've, uh, you've seen the smoke, and uh, when you come down with something, you're going to ask yourself, are these things connected? That's why CDC is on the ground and other public health officials. Where my department comes in is that we are here to hold railroad companies mm -hmm. accountable both for this incident 
and for the future, making sure that the future is safer than the past. I guess so for someone watching this, would, would, they, would someone at Norfolk Southern be accountable to them? I mean, would it be realistic to think people could reach out to them? Well, Norfolk Southern has apologized. Uh, they have promised to do everything to make it right uh, with the community. Uh, we're uh, not just going to take them at their word, though. Uh, right. we, we need to have real enforcement. We're working on that on our side based on the authority we have. I know EPA is holding them accountable on the cleanup side. Uh, but uh, for a resident who needs information, I would certainly begin uh, by getting that environmental testing that is available through state and local authorities supported by the EPA. Because of course, one of the fundamental things anybody wants to know is that their, their home is safe, their water is safe, their, their, their yard is safe, the air is safe. Uh, and uh, you can get access to that testing that I think everybody deserves uh, information on right now. Probably understandable to think residents could be concerned, though, with trains still rolling through now. I mean, can we in ensure the residents there that it is safe? Well, that's exactly why we are uh, leading this drive uh, with three parts. Our own actions as a department, things we want Congress to work with us on for the future, and calling on industry to change. Uh, industry could move right now to accelerate the way these tank cars uh, are handled. Industry could move right now to do something I know Governor DeWine is, is concerned about, and, we, and I think he's exactly right, uh, which is to get more information to states in advance of these materials moving into their jurisdictions. Uh, we're gonna raise the bar on the, uh, on the legal side, uh, but uh, these railroad companies should not wait for that in order to do the right thing. A few more questions for you. There's so many uh, to ask, really. Um, I know you don't have as much time left, but uh, have you, have you, do you feel that the, the railroad industry has resisted, been resistance to you? Absolutely. Look, uh, the railroad industry fights regulations tooth and nail. They go to the courts, they go to this department, and they go to Congress, and often they get their way. Uh, the requirement about getting those new cars that I described was watered down after industry pushed for that in Congress. Uh, often I will get letters, sometimes from members of Congress or the Senate, that have clearly been drafted by the industry, asking us to uh, soften our standards or, or soften our inspection uh, practices. They are, are an industry that has a lot of power in this town, but it's time to stand up to this industry and get things done. Uh, former President Trump will be heading there. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'll just say this. You know, one thing I learned early on in my time as a mayor dealing with a lot of disasters is that there's two kinds of people who show up uh, when there's a disaster. The folks who are there with a specific job to do and with action that's going to make a difference, and then folks who want to look good. And I'll let people make their own decisions. Uh, so I'll follow that up with asking, will you be heading there? Uh, I am planning to come. Uh, I've been uh, careful to respect the independent role of the NTSB and stay out of their way. Uh, but we're now entering the phase where it's about policy. It's about what my department does, uh, which is ensuring that there's a high standard for these railroad companies. And I think an important part of that process is to be with the residents of East Palestine, to hear their stories, and to talk about the action that we're taking right now. Uh, before I let you go, I want to circle back to the beginning here and, and talk about a couple of things that I just I, am blown away by. And, and one of them I've known for a while. I, I, I just It's hard to believe this true that uh, they do not have paid sick time in the railroad industry. Is that, is that accurate? That's one more thing that we're calling for right now uh, that the railroads can do. There are a couple of railroads, CSX and Union Pacific, that have taken steps to reach agreements with their unions to create paid sick time. All of them should do this. They should have done this a long time ago. And they shouldn't wait for a national negotiation again in order to make it happen. A, a healthy workforce is a safe workforce. And this is something that uh, people who work in railroads should be able to expect. By the way, the bigger pattern here is that the railroads have cut and cut and cut when it comes to employment, even as they're making billions and billions of dollars in profits. Uh, employment in the rail industry is down dramatically. A lot of the people who, uh, a lot of the positions that have been eliminated are positions around safety, positions around maintenance. Uh, it is time for the railroad industry to focus less on wringing out every last bit of profit out of these operations, more in, on investing in the workers and the operations so that they're safe. What about advance notification when you have this hazardous chemicals rolling through town and, and also your thoughts on the amount of time it took to react? So there are uh, requirements now. I think that those requirements need to be toughened. But again, uh, I don't think that the railroad, excuse me, I don't think the railroads should wait for uh, us to go through all of the legalities of, of that process to start proactively notifying 
uh, people that, uh, uh, that, that they're on their way through. In terms of the response, this administration has been on the ground literally from the first hours. Uh, as I said, we respect the independent role of the NTSB, uh, but we've had uh, Department of Transportation personnel on the ground uh, within the first hours uh, of the incident. Uh, EPA is on the ground, and now there's public health support coming in, too. Well, I think we have hit it all, but uh, I'll leave it open for you to add any last comments if you have any. So again, I think uh, part of doing right by the people of East Palestine is to make sure that we raise the bar on rail safety. That's the action that I'm focused on, to have real accountability uh, for Norfolk Southern and uh, a whole industry that has fought us at every turn on uh, safety and, uh, and higher standards. But I think now's the time for a change. And any of the political figures who've uh, uh, wanted to get on TV and talk about this, I am inviting them to the table to work with us because there's some real things we could get done quickly with their help in Congress. And we're going to do everything we can in the meantime with our own powers. It certainly seems like you are with the people there and, and you understand what they're going through and you're definitely backing them. And uh, boy, what a, uh, a tough time this has been for them. It is. And, and look, uh, we're talking about people who have done nothing wrong, people whose lives have been upended through no fault of their own. Norfolk Southern has to do right by them, but our country has to do right by them and any other community that lives uh, on or, or near a rail line saying, what does this incident mean for me? Am I going to be safe? Yeah, because the, the people they hear and they hear people telling them that it's safe now, but still they're, they're concerned about the future. And I, I would be, too. And, uh, you know, this is something that uh, anybody who uh, lives near a railroad now, uh, I think, is, is uh, worried about in a renewed way. But we can do something about this. Uh, actions in the past, including a higher bar on regulation, has helped to prevent train derailments and crashes. Uh, now we have to make sure that that action continues so that things like what happened in East Palestine don't happen again. All right. Well, I would like to thank you again for taking the time and good luck today. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right.